Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically, the newest killer coming to the game in the All Things Wicked chapter, known only as the Unknown. Behaviour's newest piece of nightmare fuel has arrived in the fog, and what a great arrival it is. We have our first ever sequel survivor with Sable's backstory tying directly into Michaela's. We had a long and memorably scary series of teas leading up to the PTB day, and the killer itself marks another inclusion in Dead by Daylight's small but growing ranks of non-human killers. And suffice to say, the response has been electric. After a run of three original chapters that largely failed to catch on with the majority of the player base for one reason or another, All Things Wicked seems to be a general home run and crowd pleaser for behaviour, and its killer, The Unknown, is no exception. But there's something very important to bear in mind about The Unknown that sets it apart from most of the rest of behaviour's offerings in the killer roster. This character doesn't, and can't really have a character worth exploring. And this was traditionally Behaviour's biggest strength when writing its lore. Even in stories that were themselves fairly weak, like Singularity, Dwight or Jake, they at least communicated with the character decently well. But this guy is, well, a total unknown. Before we delve too much into the inspirations behind this strange little grinning fellow, it's probably high time we go through the lore properly, because there's a lot of it, and if it's not highlighting a character, then what's really going on here? Well, the story of the unknown is told through the eyes of the freelance investigator and student, Olivia, and her visit to the sleepy American town of Greenville, where two people have disappeared in quick succession. First, a story writer vanished straight off the stage at the Moonstone Cafe in front of a room full of onlookers, and shortly afterwards, her friend vanished too. Since the police were stumped and strange rumours began to spread throughout Greenville, Olivia decided to work with the case herself. At the centre of her Pepe Sylvia theory board was a name that kept cropping up in urban legends across the country. The Unknown, a creature so foul that merely attaining its existence for long enough to investigate it would put you right in its crosshairs. Olivia rifled through newspapers and police reports to paint a picture of this unknown, and many disappearances that seemed to be attributed to it. A seance in the 19th century, a movie theatre in the 1950s, and an abandoned hospital in the 60s, all had people disappearing under mysterious circumstances and the unknown seemed to be to blame. We'll go into the implications of these later, but from these accounts Olivia built a very limited profile made of consistencies from the various unknown stories. Whatever it was, it dwelt in darkness and could mimic the voices of its victims, but beyond that, it was down to pure speculation. As she examined her evidence, Olivia realised something. Unlike the other unknown mysteries, the Greenville disappearances both featured the appearance of a strange black fog, a cameo role for everyone's favourite extra-dimensional terror. And after reaching somewhat of an impasse, Olivia decides to draw the creature based on the account she'd read, thumbing her nose at the myth and more or less daring the unknown to come and get her for having the gall to breathe it into existence. But before Olivia come to a proper conclusion, she heard a strange noise coming from her motel bathroom. Whatever was causing it was making noises that sounded disconcertingly human, and Olivia was sure she was face to face with the unknown. But before it could strike, Olivia heard a screaming from the bathroom, a horrifying primal shriek as a black fog coiled from under the door. She flung it open to see a misshapen creature fighting for its life against whatever was pulling it into the thick mass of black fog, before creature and fog alike vanished without a trace. And thus, with Olivia puzzled and picking up the pieces, the entity claimed the unknown for its own. Well, fittingly for a character called the unknown, it didn't really tell us a whole lot, did it? The unknown is an urban legend known across the country for disappearing anyone who investigates it. It can mimic the voices of people to draw victims in for the kill. But beyond that, we're not given a whole lot to work with for now. But that doesn't mean that we can't try to learn more about it from the story's context and clues, but to properly understand it, it might be wise to look at what kinds of horror inspired behaviour to create the unknown in the first place. The teaser campaign behaviour showed off in advance of this chapter was probably the best promotional material they've made for any chapter, and the immediate talk of the town was analogue horror, a subgenre popularised through internet forums and video hosting platforms in the late 2000s and early 2010s. They used found footage shooting styles with low resolution cameras with the intention of replicating footage styles of analog recording or playback devices, like VHS tapes and analog TV. Analog horror has recently undergone a resurgence with works like The Backrooms, Skinner and Rink, and The Mandela Catalog. And if you were to watch these teasers, the first instinct would be to start them with the analog horror label. But I don't believe that would necessarily be right. Because to be analog horror, you kind of need to use, well, analog technology, or at least present the illusion of it. 
and DVD's teasers are very modern by comparison, riffing on social media, group chats and camera smartphones. But just because these teasers don't technically fall under the umbrella of analogue horror, they definitely share a common horror inspiration. And to find that common source we need to hop on a time machine and go back to the end of a millennium. The late 1990s, where two little horror films were about to rock the world forever. Renew in 1998, and The Blair Witch Project in 1999. Let's set the scene here a bit. The early 90s was probably the worst period in history for horror cinema. With the titans like Freddy, Jason and Michael winding up so tired they more or less became jokes, they faded into irrelevance as we became desensitised to their antics. And while Scream tried to revive the horror world through a healthy dose of self-awareness, at the end of the day, a genre can't survive on self satirization alone. Horror needed to find its footing again. And Ringu and the Blair Witch Project offered a solution fitting to the changing times of the new millennium. The 1990s marked a renaissance of filmmaking and recording technology being available to the everyday consumer, and a greater presence of modern tech in their lives in general. And with that came the erosion of old fears and campfire tales or superstitions in favour of a whole new spectrum of things to keep you up at night. And Ringu and Blair Witch both harnessed the presence of new technology in different ways to scare the pants off you. Ringu used technology like phones and televisions as a way to transmit Sadako's curse, to ground what could easily have been a fanciful ghost story in this world freshly populated by screens and phones. And the Blair Witch Project took this one step further, by pioneering the found footage subgenre using personal camcorders and home video to present a very realistic illusion of truth to the supernatural tale of a witch prowling a cursed forest. While these films differ a lot in structure and tone, they share something that would go on to define the 2000s approach to serious horror. They suspend the viewer's disbelief only enough to scare you shitless and no more. Stripping away the campiness and melodrama of decades prior to keep you second guessing whether or not this could really happen to you. Analog horror like the backrooms and the rake followed in these footsteps, using technology and the point of view of the camera as both a framing device for the story and as a way to communicate an atmosphere of paranoia and uncertainty. The new chapter and its teasers rely very strongly on that induced paranoia that became characteristic of these new modern horrors, and this comes through in the killer power design as much as it does in the lore. I'll be the first to admit, I don't really know what a grenade launcher full of grape juice has to do with psychological horror urban legends, but I have to give credit to the power's other elements as it perfectly embodies the kind of horror we're dealing with here. The camera that snaps around you to dispel the hallucinations, and the fact that you have to turn your survivor camera to stare down the unknown to counter its power, both evoke the paranoia and limited perspective that's proven key to making this kind of horror effective time and time again. Forcing you to look closely at this thing that shouldn't really exist, to literally and figuratively face your fears. It's a thematic home run and a power that kind of doesn't seem like it. A very elegant touch that calls back to the uncomfortable POV shots of found footage and analogue horror. But how does understanding the artistic inspirations of this chapter help us figure out the truth behind the unknown? I think the best way we could look at it is to take the fragmented pieces of story that Olivia dug up in the lore and compare them to what we already know about the horror that surrounds the unknown, the genre conventions that inspired its creation, and the existing cosmic horror world of the entity that's brushed up against it. Sit down Olivia, I'll be taking it from here. Let's paint a picture of what the unknown really is. I, hang on, wait, what's that at the door? Oh sorry, yeah, give me a sec. Oh, God, no. No. Ah! All right, sorry about that. Jehovah's Witnesses, man, they get more pushy every time. Anyway, let's talk about the unknown. To understand this big old beastie, the first thing I suggest we look at is Olivia's list of disappearance sites to see where they all tie in. Olivia has catalogued several incidents throughout history as the work of the unknown, and a lot of these seem familiar at first glance. The group of teens who went missing at the theatre in the 50s, for example, seems like a reference to the Greenville Theatre map, which arrived in this chapter. But the Moonstone Cafe ad, and the Sable and Michaela graffiti on the statue outside, affirms that the Greenville Theatre is from the modern day. The government studies Olivia found that relate to a Black Ops research project codenamed Apple Pie have also led many to believe that the unknown is related in some way to the Doctor. Since Project Apple Pie was a study into hallucinogenic drugs as a method of mind control during the Cold War, just like the Doctor was pioneering at the Larry's Morin Institute at the same time. It's important to remember though that even if the Unknown was a part of Project Apple Pie in the 50s, then Doctor was almost certainly not involved, because we know that the Doctor worked on a different study at the Larry's Institute, Project Awakening under the CIA, pursuing the same goals but in a different location run by a different group of people. One of Olivia's leading theories is that the Unknown was a failed government experiment let loose by the Office of Strategic Services in the 50s. 
which I'm pretty comfortable discarding as a theory here for a couple of reasons. For one, unknown disappearances are well predated this date, with the earliest recorded one being in the 19th century. But there's another, far more frustrating reason. The apple pie theory doesn't make sense, because apple pie doesn't make sense at all. We're repeatedly told that apple pie was run by the OSS in the 50s, but a simple Google search will tell you that President Truman dissolved the OSS in 1945 via executive order, splitting it into the INR and the CIA. So unless we're living in a timeline where the OSS and the CIA somehow existed together in the 50s, behaviour's probably done a crows and chili thing here, and just totally cocked up a basic fact that could have taken 30 seconds to Google. Again. I feel comfortable discounting the government experiment theory here, that doesn't mean it isn't going to be the explanation behaviour winds up going with, especially since Unknown has a lot of elements that suggest a scientific explanation, like the UVX grenades that he fires, and the iridescent OSS report add-on for the power. If Behaviour does choose to pursue this backstory for the Unknown in the mid-chapter tone that he'll be getting soon, I have my concerns about how good this story is going to be, because if they can't even get the basic facts right about when the OSS stopped being an organisation, I dread to think how they're going to handle writing a story about it. It's also clear that the unknown escapades are by no means limited to Greenville. Olivia refers to Sable and McKenna disappearances as the Greenville incidents, but the other vanishings are not part of this phenomenon, affirming that nothing about the unknown is inherent to a specific place or time. The last thing that we know for reasonably sure is that the unknown is not explicitly the product of the entity. The two seem to be fairly independent of one another. Olivia found the records of Michaela and Sable disappearances both involve the appearance of a thick black fog, a telltale sign of the entity's presence. But that isn't normal for unknown attacks. So unless the earlier records happen to all miss a thick black fog at all the incident sites, it's strongly suggested that the two aren't related to each other and the entity's abduction of the unknown in Olivia's motel bathroom is the first time the pair have crossed paths. Okay, so we've got lots that we've managed to rule out, but no conclusive answers yet. So what at this point do I think the unknown really is? I believe the unknown is an urban legend that has been made real by people's fear of it. It hunts down those who investigate it, because those people are the ones who, through their scepticism and desire to know the truth, reject their fear, and thus reject the unknown's power. First things first, there is definitely a precedent for creatures like this in analogue horror and found footage works, to thrive on fear and specifically target anyone who tries to understand, rationalise or confront them. Slender Man is a great example here. Throughout all iterations of the Slenderman mythos, a common thread has been Slendy's choice of targets. The more you think about him, the more likely he is to target you. But this is a trend that predates analog horror. Freddy Krueger, Pennywise and Candyman have all been shown to have their power tied intrinsically to their legend, with those who remember or fear them giving them the strength they need to regain power and hurt people again. By tempting fate and investigating the creature that kills you if you investigate it, Olivia was, in her own way, challenging the unknown, doubting its power and the truth of its story, and that's what brought it upon her. And this is something that the chapter's two biggest cinematic inspirations did too. The events of Ringu and the Blair Witch Project both started because people stuck their noses in where they didn't belong, and doubted the power of these modern legends. If Tomoko and Raiko hadn't watched the tape that kills you if you watch it, had accepted its power at face value, and left it well alone, nobody would have died. And the same goes for the film crew in the Blair Witch Project. By choosing to film in the witch's cursed forest, the group rejected the wisdom to leave her alone and more or less asked, what's the worst that could happen? Before the witch showed them, you know, the worst that could happen. This type of horror became popular in online horror communities after Ringu and Blair Witch because it perfectly preyed on the consumption habits of modern skeptics. The advent of the video camera, the personal telephone and the internet have led society as a whole to be more willing to ask questions and reject superstition. So supernatural horrors that prey on those who choose to interrogate the folklore and refuse to believe in them anymore is the perfect predator in this new social environment. And the unknown is a great representation of that fear. It thrives on not being understood because it needs to be feared. The closer Olivia came to rationalising it, the less she would fear it, and if her findings ever made it public, that might be enough to demolish the legend of the unknown forever. If everyone understands you, who's left to fear you? After all, what fear is more powerful than fear of the unknown? But that begs the question, this thing had a government body investigating it for years, the alleged OSS, so why didn't it go after them? Surely by trying to rationalise it on a federal scale, that would drive the unknown to go after them. 
But here's where things get a little interesting, because I don't believe that the government entity trying to understand the unknown was really a government entity at all. Jonah, Carmina, Elodie and Nicolas Cage have all shown us that the operatives of the Black Veil, the cult that worships the entity on Earth, have their claws in government institutions across the world, and have had for decades. In their efforts to serve the entity, they've been conducting unethical arcade experiments for years, such as the ones the twins were subjected to and many that the Blight oversaw, and the horrifying experiments conducted by the OSS during their investigations into the unknown fit perfectly within the Black Veil's normal MO. I believe the OSS in this context is a Black Veil front, to look into the unknown and the circumstances of its creation, but the unknown didn't go after them because they weren't trying to rationalise it, but because they were trying to replicate it. Think about it. The unknown thrives in environments where fear of it is high, but understanding its existence as a fact of life is discouraged. It causes those who know too much about it to disappear without a trace, and it exists as an urban legend among communities who have no other explanation for its existence. Does this sound familiar to you? Because it should. These conditions are identical to the ones manufactured by the Black Veil and Otto Stamper that allowed for the creation of the Dredge. The Ottomarians are basically a petri dish, used to cultivate fear of their town's boogeyman, and when the rumours and stories became fully saturated among the populace, when the fear reached a fever pitch, that was enough to bring the legend of the Drawney to life. That's why I think the unknown is an urban legend brought to life through the fear of it, because we've seen that artificially inducing the same conditions the unknown exists in produces a similar result. If the dread is a test tube baby intentionally created by the Black Veil, then the unknown is an immaculate conception, something created spontaneously that inspired the Black Veil to replicate its conditions, either to summon the unknown for study or capture, or to create their own. It may even have been what sparked the entity to seize the unknown for itself in the first place when it attacked Olivia. The Black Veil were finding out that the creature was beyond their ability to control, and effectively passing responsibility up the chain of command. But how does a creature like the unknown even exist? How does an urban legend come to life? Well, if you've been watching my videos for the past couple of months, you've probably already got the answer. But in case you haven't, I want to draw your attention to the Observer Tomes from a few years ago now, that talk about something called the Trinitarian of Creation. It's a physical constant of the multiverse that the Observer identifies, and it claims that imaginary objects and people can become real, through the fusion of powerful emotions and concentrated consciousness to create physical objects. I think that's what happened in this case. Back in that 19th century seance, where the first recorded unknown attack took place, they saw something they didn't know how to explain. A vision of another world, perhaps of the entity's realm itself even, where a monster that reveled in fear and preyed on the inquisitive stalked the darkness and mimicked the voices of its victims. These are the first people to truly fear the unknown, and all it took was one person to doubt what they saw, one person to challenge the unknown's power, to allow it to break into our world and become its first victim. This wouldn't be the first time that a story in the world of DVD has facilitated its own creation and become real. The same thing happened to the Skull Merchant, who released almost exactly a year ago. The traumatised mangaka Saita Imai saw visions of a high-tech headhunter committing brutal murders in the fog and turned that into his story, Soñadores Sombrios, the same story that his daughter Adriana took as inspiration to become the Skull Merchant, bring the story to life and unwittingly inspire its creation. I believe the unknown came to be in a similar way. Instead of the visions of a damaged artist bringing the character to life through his daughter, it's the visions of a group of mystics and mediums bringing it to life through sheer mortal terror. It would even explain the mishmash of physical traits the unknown displays. Olivia suggested that people thought it to be a government experiment, an alien, or a regular serial killer, and it has resemblances to all of these things. It wields an axe and stands like a human killer, but it fires an unusual substance like an alien or a mutant, and its use of hallucinations brings to mind the hallucinogenic drugs used by the OSS. It is, in every sense, exactly what you fear it is, because it is truly made of that fear. Of course this is just my theory, my, uh, <coughs> game theory. And the ambiguity of the unknown's backstory means that we may never know for sure. I might be completely wrong, you might have wasted the better part of half an hour watching this video. I'm not gonna lie to you, it's really cool that we don't know all about what this thing is yet. That we might never know for sure. Don't get me wrong here, I'm normally the kind of guy who's there for, you know, character characters as opposed to big plotty mysteries, but the unknown has been a lot of fun to sink my teeth into. And the fact that we're getting a tome so shortly after it comes out is just icing on the cake, 
because for once the mystery is part of the appeal and I've got no idea what to expect. Will we get hard and fast answers? Will we get implied answers? Will we just get more questions? I'm not sure, but I can't wait to find out. So what's my final verdict on this killer as a whole? Honestly, this, really, all of this is pretty damn good. It's not likely to be one of my like special favourite killers or anything, but I can safely say I'm happier about pretty much every aspect of this killer than I have been about any aspect of the killers since probably about Sadako, with one notable and very obvious exception. I do have a few relatively small hang-ups though that are quite personal to me. I think the ambulation is uninspired, and I should probably crawl around more in the trials. I think the grenade launcher part of the power is a major thematic miss by it being pretty fun to use. And I don't mean to be rude here, but the kind of horror the unknown is based on just doesn't really click with me most of the time. I've never loved creepypastas or analog horror, and my opinion was most certainly not improved when the subgenre birthed some of the worst horror films I've ever seen in my entire life. If you want my final verdict on the killer as a whole, from the lore to the visuals to the power, I think I'd give it a comfortable 7 out of 10. Which doesn't sound too great, but bearing in mind that my average verdict on most killers in the past two years has sat at about a 4, that's a passing grade. The unknown is a good killer, even if it kind of isn't my thing, I do think the integration between gameplay and story could be a little better. But even though the power struggles fit with the lore at times, I can't say the unknown isn't a perfectly fine inclusion to DVD's roster. We've wanted a psychological, analogue, horror-y, found footage monster for a very long time, and I'm finally here to grant your wishes. My arrival in the fog will be auspicious, and I simply can't... Damn it. I slipped up there, didn't I? Well, it was fun while it lasted. You know, with all the voices to mimic, I think this was a pretty good one, don't you? Wasn't easy. Condensing all that ego, that phony affectation of intelligence. But I'd say it was worth it. You'll share this video, won't you? With all your friends, your family, anyone really. Or just keep it to yourself. Hopefully you won't forget it. Nothing like a twist ending to keep me fresh in your minds. Food for thought, perhaps. Feel free to speculate in the comments section and keep your eyes open for the chapter's release on March the 12th. Till then, I'll see you around. And that, I'm afraid, is a promise.